to give up, but we find it so... Well, I wouldn't say difficult, but I resist because it's forbidden. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't like the idea of me giving up just because other people decided for me. But mostly they talked here about the collection he had designed for her for the Cannes Film Festival. Today, in her middle 60s, Jean Moreau still commands the limousines, the flashbulbs, the adoring fans, all the trappings of the legendary star she's been for 35 years. But she remains very much a working actress doing two or three films a year for movies and television. She has never stopped working. I, I'd hate to be on your wrong side. <laughs> her remarkable career would surprise one early director who told her to her face when she was starting out that she was simply not beautiful enough to be a success in films. He looked at me and said, as though I was a, a vase, he said, well... She's okay, I know, but look at those things under her eyes. And her face is a little crooked. Um, no, she's not very photogenic. You were how old? Twenty-one. Disaster for you, his saying that? Well, no. I thought, well, you old bugger. How do you know? I make it my way. And she did, when she met an unknown director named Louis Mal. He dispensed with the old-fashioned studio lighting and makeup and the camera tripod then in fashion, and he put her on the streets of Paris with a jazz score by Miles Davis. The film was Elevator to the Gallows. It was the first film Louis Mal ever made. And there we were with hand camera in the streets of Paris, and uh, I was sharing with him something extraordinary. And, and you fell in love. We both fell in love, yeah. The film was a surprise success, which led immediately to their next one together, The Lovers. For its time, in the late 50s, an astonishingly candid look at a married woman who takes a lover. The intimate scenes between Moreau and her screen lover made the film a sensation. In Cleveland... A projectionist was jailed just for showing the movie. Moreau and Louis Mal were lovers during the making of the picture, but something happened to their relationship while she was performing the sexual scenes that he was directing. I felt that during the, the filming, I had the impression that it was what I was giving was leaving me at the same time, mm -hmm. as though our relationship our love was feeding the screen and leaving us in real life. And I was right. I can understand as a man, there's my love on the screen and she's making love and she For is... For me. Hmm? For me. I'm the one who orders her to do that. Ah, uh, yes. And she does it so well. And it was a gift to him. I would have never done that with another director. That but that was the end of the affair? Yes, but that's what life is about. Nothing lasts. Part of what makes this woman fascinating is that she's been as passionate about her life off the screen as on. Her affair with Louis Mal, now married to Candace Bergen, was common knowledge. She had a long relationship, too, with fashion designer Pierre Cardin. Are you serially, or have you been serially monogamous? Oh, yes. When you're with a guy, you are with a guy. Oh, yeah. And then mostly, you discard him or he discards you. Well, I have to admit that I was the one who went away. Always? But maybe it was the fear of being left. If one wants to be frank. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's a story, tell me if it's true, that uh, you've made out, what, 90 or 100 films? No, 90. 90. 90 films, and that you have fallen in love with an actor, maybe you're the lead actor, or the director of 
almost every one of 90 films. Oh, true? no, no, that's not true. Come on. I, I, I'm a busy person. <laughs> but just imagine. I mean, what a schedule. No, 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 no. No. She was first married when she was 20 to a French actor, Jean-Louis Richard. They married the day before she gave birth to their son, who is now an artist living in California. Her second marriage was to the American director, William Friedkin, in 1978. This marriage lasted just 18 months. Coming from France and moving to Hollywood, were you comfortable or a fish out of water in any sense? True. No, I always loved being in America. I'd been in America many, many times. I had friends over there. What was uncomfortable was the marriage. It has nothing to do with California. Once I was with... I was supposed to be Mrs. William Friedkin. And that sounds so strange to me. <laughs> it does that, still. And the, my, my usual friends didn't call me anymore. So I was there. I was alone in a house with a man I married. But, I mean, where was Jean Moreau? It was impossible. That's where I was wrong. And he was wrong, too. He was wrong in... In asking me to marry him or in expecting me to submit. I cannot submit to anyone. It's not a gift to somebody to submit. One has to be equal. One is a partner in life. About her private life right now? She told us that right now she's not involved with anyone and she doesn't mind a bit. There is a feeling in America that passion in a woman of a certain age is unseemly. They're right. Passion is unseemly? Oh, come on, passion. When you get 60, you know about love. Yeah. But love is not passion? No. But there's nothing wrong with passion. I mean, why is passion at the age of 60? I would hate, I would hate to be, to be still... Overcome with passion. I'm astonished that you say that. No, no, I've done that before. I have passion for life, but I know about love. Love and passion don't go together. Passion is destructive. Passion is demanding. Passion is jealous. Passion goes up and down. Love is constant. You were talking about fidelity. That's what love is about. Mm -hmm. Compassion. You give even more than you receive. That's what love is about. I would hate to be still victim of passion. I would think, God, I've lived all these years and I'm still, I've learned nothing. Run into her on the streets of Paris, away from the glitter, the flash bulbs, the limousines. She could be any single career woman shopping for dinner. If she's recognized by an admirer, she doesn't consider it an intrusion. <laughs> Earlier this year, she played with Joan Plowright in the summer house, the part of a flamboyant woman with a lurid past. She was making love to my foot. Who? The dog. He's not capable of that. Well, he was thinking about it. And during the past summer, she worked in a miniseries in Berlin on Catherine the Great. She played the Empress Elizabeth opposite Omar Sharif. This is not Elizabeth. All Europe knows I'm beautiful. When we asked her how long she intended to work, she replied simply that artists never retire. Jean Marot, Marlene Dietrich. Two aging Superb actresses or personalities or whatever. And she turned her face away. She would not perform. She would not do this. And, I, and when she died in Paris, I think a great many people felt very sorry for her. Well, I think, I think Marlena, like lots of actresses of that period, are victims. Victims of? Victims of that sort of fame, of those faces, stars. They have to worry about their cheekbones, about their neck, 
and carry the image of eternal youth, but that's not true. Why don't you? Apparently you don't. Because I love life. I love freedom. And why should I limit my life? Accept my life to be limited because other people say so. Is there no vanity in you? Not that one. No. No. No, I mean, why, why accept to have a life as long as that when I have a life as long as that and maybe a little further just because there are a few wrinkles? You know what the problem is with people who are aging? It's what goes on inside. I don't mind the wrinkles. I don't mind that. What I do mind, it's what, what, what comes forward. What comes forth. Anxiety, greed, resentment. If it's, if it's a face that shows uh, curiosity, uh, what's going to happen now? Oh, look at that face. What's happening there? It moves on. That's, that's what life is about.